A top African cardinal is raising eyebrows with his wait-and-see approach to how the Synod will handle the hot-button issue of homosexuality. Join us with the latest from the Eternal City Church Milton's Rome correspondent, Dr. Jules Gomez. Uh, Jules, who is the uh, top African cardinal and what's he saying? Uh, Brad, on Friday at the press conference at which journalists were present to talk about uh, the Synod on Synodality, uh, we had the presence of a very senior African cardinal, the Metropolitan Archbishop of Ginsaha from the Democratic Republic of Congo. We're talking about uh, Cardinal Fridolin Ambongo Bezungu. Uh, Bezungu was made Cardinal by Pope Francis in 2019. And uh, he was asked about, you know, one of the most pressing hot button issues being discussed by the Synodal Fathers, uh, that is the blessing of same sex couples, or more generally, the inclusion of active homosexuals within the church. And this is what he said. He said, on the LGBT issue, the Lord himself, through collective discernment, will show us the direction. It wasn't a yes or a no, or this is what the church teaches. It was a wait and see. Now, why is his take specifically so important, and why is uh, his take raising some eyebrows? Uh, for a number of reasons, Brad, because first of all, we all know that uh, Africans in general, and particularly African clergy and the bishops, have been very uh, vocal, not, not perhaps not very vocal openly, but they have been, uh, you know, not at all in favor of... Uh accepting the practice of homosexuality. They've spoken out, you know, in muted voices in the Catholic Church, but uh, very stridently in the Anglican Communion. So uh, uh, Bezungu, interestingly, had the opportunity to put his foot down and explain what the church teaches, but he did not do that. Now, remember, Bezungu has a licentiate in moral theology from the Alfonsianum in Rome, which is one of the premier institutes here for moral theology. Uh, and yet he did, did not bring out any of you know, that uh, expertise, uh, that, those skills, the academic learning that he has. Uh, uh, but also very interesting is the fact that Pope Francis with Anglican Archbishop Justin Welby visited the Democratic Republic of Congo and uh, Kinsaha in particular. And I know from my own background that Archbishop Welby has, is very well connected in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And of course, he's a very close uh, ecumenical partner and friend of Pope Francis. So we have here uh, an archbishop who normally would speak his mind, a cardinal who would normally speak his mind, suddenly very quiet and very coy about the whole thing, because obviously he's been personally in, visited by Pope Francis, he's been chosen for this very high position, he's been given a red hat, he's been invited to participate in the Senate, and he simply wanted to, he didn't want to rock the boat, but wanted to sing from the Senate same hymn sheet as the rest of the Senate Fathers. Uh, before moving on, Jules, it also strikes me, though, that there's um, this gag order on speaking any specifics about the Senate and, and all of that seems to also be in place here. Is that uh, probably playing into all this somehow in your, in your estimation or in the estimation of others? Well, I, I don't think the gang order would have applied to him in this case because he wasn't asked to reveal anything specific about what he he said or what others are saying. He was simply asked to deal with a topic in general. But that's a very good question, Brad. Shifting gears for a moment, Jules, uh, the Catholic women were out in protest last week in Rome uh, for female ordinations. Can you tell us about that? Right. Now, you know, you really need to qualify the word Catholic here because these women are strident activists for 
women's ordination, not just as deacons, but as priests and even as bishops. Now, in the crowd, you can see a lady called Jamie Manson. Uh, Manson was uh, the book's editor at the very left-wing National Catholic Reporter for a very long time. Uh, she is part of the whole women's ordinations movement, and we've seen pictures where she apparently is celebrating the Holy Eucharist. She is, uh, you know, uh, she has, a, she's wearing a stole. And uh, uh, if that indeed is the case, uh, then this is very serious because we know, you know, Brad, that uh, uh, lay Catholics simulating the celebration of the Eucharist, uh, you know, that the penalty is excommunication. Uh, but uh, Manson is not just a strident uh, campaigner for women's ordination, that uh, she is also a, she calls herself a pro-choice Catholic, and she leads the pro-choice Catholic movement, which, of course, is euphemism for uh, killing babies, pro-abortion. And yet she still claims to be a Catholic. In fact, uh, uh, she is acclaimed in much of the Catholic world. And uh, in 2020, Fairfield University in the United States, I think it was the Center for Catholic Studies there, invited her to deliver a lecture on women's ordination. There's no uh, surprise, no, no big surprise anyway, that she uh, worked for National Catholic Distorter, I mean reporter, uh, here in the United States. There, uh, That's kind of along their, their lines of reasoning in, in many areas. Uh, finally, the Vatican Secretary of State, Jules, has high hopes for the Senate and for Catholicism and uh, re reversing the decline in Italy. What's he saying? Well, very interestingly, Cardinal Pietro Parolin, you know, the second uh, highest uh, officer in the, the hierarchy in the Vatican, uh, second in command to Pope Francis, uh, said that he was very optimistic that the Senate would reverse the drastic and devastating decline in church attendance that has suddenly hit it Italy, particularly after the COVID, uh, and as a result of, you know, clergy, bishops, uh, and even the Pope ordering the close down, the shutdown of the churches. Uh, in fact, the situation is so serious that uh, two de decades ago, 36.4% uh, Catholics attended weekly mass. After COVID, that number has fallen to 18.8%. Now, um, uh, th th this is extremely serious because all these years, Italy was cons considered to be an exception to the general a trend of secularization that has swept across Europe and, you know, basically decimated the churches there. However, now we are seeing the same trend hit Italy as well, and that is very serious. But of course, if Cardinal Parolin thinks that uh, his uh, synodality and he says dialogue is going to reverse the process and turn the ship around, he's sadly mistaken. Just live in Rome talk to people on the road, and they are simply not interested in what is going on. I was speaking to priests over the weekend and asking about, uh, you know, the discussions going on in the various religious communities in Rome, and priests told me that, you know, most most of them couldn't care less. They're simply indifferent to what is going on. Now, if, if religious and priests are indifferent to the synodal process, imagine the attitude of the lay people. And that was very clearly demonstrated at the so-called ecumenical service, which, which by the way, even uh, Italian evangelicals have, uh, have, have uh, uh, objected to the fact that some senior international evangelical leaders participate that's not gone down very well with local evangelical leaders. Uh, but uh, the, the attendance was abysmal. The uh, Vatican media was desperately, you know, trying to move their cameras away from uh, the uh, piazza in St. Peter's Square, uh, which was basically empty, and nobody was interested in either the ecumenical service or the consistory that followed it. 
Uh, before closing, Jules, I, it just came across my mind here that the uh, bias or the presumption, I should say, going back to uh, right after Vatican II, that if we lessen up on all the rules, you know, like religious orders, they don't have to wear their habit, don't have to pray in common, all these things, lightening up on discipline, uh, maybe, and this idea that Parallel, I wonder if he's looking at the same type of thing where, you know, homosexuals uh, can have their... Uh, relationship blessed in some way, shape, or form, and then uh, allowing uh, those who are divorced and remarried or living in some objective uh, state of, uh, objective state of mortal sin, uh, have, you know, come forward for Holy Communion on their own uh, recognizance. If we lessen up in those areas, and I wonder if they're looking at the synod uh, to uh, the outcome of that as a lessening up of that, uh, that that will somehow revitalize things. But we always saw for the last 60 years, the more you lessen up on discipline, uh, the more you just go into decline. Your thoughts on that? Uh, Brad, again, thank you for asking that question. I think we've discussed this earlier on a previous Rome dispatch. Uh, and it, uh, I quoted a, a significant study done by a very famous Canadian sociologist. I think it was 2015 or 2016. And this study has been now quoted by upteen numbers of other sociologists studying the field of uh, practicing, you know, Christians. Now, what he demonstrated was he looked at uh, a number of Protestant denominations in Canada, and he uh, he was able to prove uh, that the more you loosen up on the demands made to the laity and the clergy, uh, the less attractive Christianity becomes to people. So he discovered uh, quite conversely that uh, those churches that had the highest number of people coming and worshipping with them, joining them, uh, giving money, you know, giving their lives to service and the ministry, were those churches that made the highest demands, that demanded, you know, people go the extra mile in their walk of discipleship. Now, uh, that study, of course, has percolated all over the Western world, whether it's in the Protestant churches or the Catholic churches, and if people like Pietro Parolin and the experts, so-called in the Catholic church, have not yet you know, woken up and smelled the coffee and seen the data, then uh, this sort of, uh, you know, uh, virus of wishful thinking is, is really going to be incurable. Well, we'll have to send him a, a, a copy of the latest Rome Dispatch, Jules, see if we can't uh, get him to smell that coffee. So the, the, the consensus seems to be the Synod won't settle any individual church problem, <clears throat> but may well change how the church deals with such problems moving forward. That how may include, for instance, leaving the choice of blessing same-sex couples up to an individual priest. It may include such things as leaving the choice of reception of Holy Communion to those living in objectively immoral situations up to that individual person. Uh, such changes seem to have been heralded last week in correspondence between Pope Francis and cardinals asking about these very issues. But uh, there doesn't seem to be a consensus among clerics and laity, however, on whether such changes would flow from God's mercy or from his wrath. Jules, thank you so much for your update and your analysis. Thank you, Brad. Thanks again for watching today's episode of Rome Dispatch. This show is brought to you by donors like Real Estate for Life. If you're looking to buy or sell a home and want to support our mission, visit realestateforlife.org. Again, that's realestateforlife.org. Be sure to tell them Church Militant sent you. God bless.